engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Good evening. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat and try that again. Good evening. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. It is 10 after the hour and the phone number is 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. You can get me on the internet at EW Erickson on all the social media or eric at the com is the email address. I want to begin with a new story we talked about briefly yesterday. We don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I'm actually, I'm shocked enough that the reaction to people from what I said last night on the air and, and what I said last night has actually become a new story today. Um, and I've been fielding phone calls from reporters about it. It's just, it's the, the stupid little, it should be a generally a throwaway story about uh, United uh, the flight attendant forcing the lady to put her dog in the overhead bin where the dog barked itself. It barked and barked and barked until it suffocated to death and died. And I said last night on the program towards the end of the show that uh, United is not alone to blame for this. That you had a woman who voluntarily put her dog in an overhead bin to its death and you had a bunch of passengers around who did nothing many of whom I'm sure are, are pet owners or dog lovers. They did nothing. And as much as it's inexcusable that the flight attendant did this, that the pilot allowed it to happen, that United uh, let this happen, and United has a terrible track record with, with handling pets, there's also something for the failure of people to stand up and, and say something. And the number of people who were outraged by me saying this is if they're to, to blame. Well, what do you mean? You can't stand up to a flight attendant. You can't stand up to a flight attendant. No, no, no. They'll put you in jail. Homeland Security will meet you. Y'all, I'm sorry. If it was my dog, I would have gotten off the plane. I would have caused a scene saying I'm I'm leaving the plane. I'm not flying. If I saw someone else having to put their dog in the overhead bin, I would say this is not advisable. You shouldn't do this. Perhaps you should get off the plane. Let the captain know, a gate agent, someone the number of people who apparently live in fear of flight attendants. Somebody actually replied to me on social media after the show and said, you must have a sponsorship by United trying to cut into Delta's market, and you fly first class anyway. In economy, you have to listen to the flight attendant or else. No, you don't. I fly economy all the time. I don't fly enough anymore to be a platinum medallion. I get put in economy, and if I don't get upgraded, I stay in economy. Flight attendants are not dictators, even on United. And you are the customer. Whatever happened to the customer is always right. You don't understand. Apparently, people think I don't understand this. I fly all the time. I have literally flown every single week this month. I, I do know something about flying. I even know something about flying on United. I try to avoid it like the plague because I don't think it's a very comfortable airline to fly. And I'm in Atlanta, so I fly Delta everywhere. Even if I don't care for their management, I like Delta a lot. The people who Delta, you'd be surprised the number of flight attendants and pilots who stop me and they listen to the show. It is insane to me that people think they can't stand up to a flight attendant who's doing something stupid. Somebody actually said on social media today, as this was blowing up into a controversial non-controversy that, oh, and I bet you think people can stand up to the police too or hold a gun at them. Is a flight attendant holding a gun at you? You know, C.S. Lewis talked about men without chest. That's exactly what we're dealing with here. People who can't stand up. The dog died and didn't have to. And you know, here's the other thing. As an aside here, the fact pattern of this is that it was a mother with two kids after a long day of travel, frazzled, didn't want to pick a fight with the flight attendant over the dog and let it go and might not have known any better. Where are the people around this mother sticking up for the mom and kids and their dog? Nowhere to be seen, apparently. That's that's just pitiful. It really is. Now we can move on because there's some really damning news about the shooter in Florida. Real Clear Politics, you know, the, the site Real Clear Politics, they now have a site Real Clear Investigations. And I want to read you a portion of an investigative piece written by Paul Speary. Despite committing a string of arrestable offenses on campus before the Florida school shooting, 
Nicholas Cruz was able to escape the attention of law enforcement, pass a background check, and purchase the weapon he used to slaughter three staff members and 14 fellow students because of Obama administration efforts to make school discipline more lenient. Documents reviewed by Real Clear Investigations and interviews show that his school district in Florida's Broward County was in the vanguard of a strategy adopted by more than 50 major school districts nationwide, allowing thousands of troubled, often violent students to commit crimes without legal consequence. The aim was to slow the so-called school-to-prison pipeline. Now, listen to this. This is... I mean, this is mind-blowing. In 2013, the year before Cruz entered high school, the Broward County school system rewrote its discipline policy to make it much more difficult for administrators to suspend or expel problem students or for campus police to arrest them for misdemeanors, including some of the crimes Cruz allegedly committed in the years and months leading up to the deadly February 14th shooting at his Fort Lauderdale area school. The new policy resulted from an Obama administration effort begun in 2011 to keep students in school and improve racial outcomes and came against a backdrop of other efforts to rein in perceived excesses and zero tolerance discipline policies, including in Florida. Broward School Superintendent Robert Runcy, a Chicagoan and Harvard graduate with close ties to President Obama and his education department, signed an agreement with the county sheriff and other local jurisdictions to trade cops for counseling. Students charged with various misdemeanors, including assault, would now be disciplined through participation in so-called healing circles, obstacle courses, and other self-esteem building exercises. Now, why did they do this? Well, you are probably aware of the political left in this country embracing the phrase systemic racism. The whole system is racist. And one of the things that they look at is rates of suspension and expulsion. And if black students are suspended or expelled disproportionately, it is proof of systemic racism. Race in the system. The whole system is corrupt. And so one of the ways that they try to do this is to essentially stop suspending and expelling kids. They made it a one-for-one deal. If you're going to suspend a black kid, you got to suspend a Hispanic kid. If you're going to suspend a Hispanic kid, you got to suspend a white kid. There are schools, by the way, here in Georgia that do this. You do need to understand this. I talk to teachers all the time who say this is a problem, that uh, they're not expelling or suspending or even severely punishing kids because they've adopted a racial quota system. That if you suspend a white kid and then you suspend two black kids, well, then you've got to go back and suspend another white kid before you can suspend any more black kids or you run afoul of the quota. I talk to teachers who tell me this here in Georgia, this happens. Now, One of the, well, I'm looking at the clock. I don't want to be bad on clock management, but we got to get into one of the reasons this is done because this is a cover for something other than racism that the left doesn't want to talk about. And it is deeply directly relevant in this situation. Let me take a quick time out for a sponsor, which came in really handy for me this week. Text Eric, E-R-I-C-K, to 303030. That's 303030 or 303030. Text Eric there now to let the magic happen. I'm talking about Beachbody On Demand. Now, you're probably not aware of Beachbody On Demand per se, but you know some of their programs, P90X, Insanity, 21 Day Fix, the three-week yoga retreat. Okay, retweet, retreat, if I can talk. Okay, let me get serious here for a minute. Last week, I had a pinched nerve in my foot, which I'd never had before. It was the worst pain. Now, I admit I don't have high pain tolerance, but I've had surgeries, whatnot. This hurt worse than anything. I thought I had broken my foot. It was swollen and red to begin with. Uh, the, the pain went away, but or the, the swelling went away, but the pain didn't. I could not walk on my foot at all, and I had to go to Los Angeles. And I'd been using the Beachbody On Demand product on my Apple TV with their yoga program, particularly the stretching. 
and in California on my iPad was still able to get it. And it actually was a handy stretching program. Uh, really helped a lot with my calf muscle from limping and everything as, as the pinch was working its way out. The medicine was doing its job. Uh, really actually used this program while I was in L.A. Uh, came in handy. You can get it on your phone. You can get it on a tablet. You can get it on a TV. Really excellent to be able to watch on-demand exercises. You don't have to worry about DVDs and stuff. I do highly recommend their yoga package, which I've been using just for flexibility, and the stretching came in super handy while traveling with my foot problem. Give it a try. My listeners are going to get a free trial membership when you text ERIC to 303030. You're going to get full access to the entire platform for free. All the workouts and nutrition information free. All you've got to do is text ERIC, E-R-I-C-K, to 303030. Go do it right now. Text ERIC to 303030. And thank you to Beachbody On Demand for sponsoring the show. It's 26 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. So if you're just tuning in, there's a really incredible story at Real Clear Investigations, part of the Real Clear Politics family. I guess now they call it the Real Clear family. Um, and many of you are aware of this because we've talked about the general parameters of this program during the Obama administration years where essentially they decided to claim there was that school violence and whatnot were on the decline because they refused to allow local schools taking federal dollars to punish bad kids. And one of the claims that they made was that there was, was systemic racism and that as a result, that if there were more black kids being suspended than white kids, it was proof of racism and, and there could be a federal investigation. There could be federal audit. So schools stopped disciplining kids. One of the reasons that this has occurred in this country is because the left, particularly, cannot really wrap its mind around the collapse of the two-parent nuclear heterosexual household. And you're not supposed to talk about such things these days, I realize. But... Up until the left completely took over all the sociological and medical organizations in this country so that the inmates are now running the asylum and crazy is considered normal and normal is crazy, uh, study after study after study has shown that the two-parent nuclear household, particularly the two-parent heterosexual nuclear household, is the most stable way to raise a child. And... Through social policies in this country since the 1960s, the family has broken apart. And a child in this country is more likely now to be born out of wedlock, uh, born to into a single-parent household. And those kids disciplinarily tend to um, have problems. And unfortunately, there actually is a racial discrepancy in the data here. And you have a lot of kids from minority households coming from bro broken homes in the schools. And they have discipline problems. And the schools have decided to wave away all of the discipline problems and scream, well, it's all racism, instead of dealing with the problems coming from the collapse of family. It's 40 after the hour. Eric Erickson here, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. A buddy of mine suggested, I, I probably want to clarify something before I get in trouble. I, look, I know that the shooter in Florida um, had a, a mother and an adoptive father, both of whom passed away, and he was with other families. Um, if you can't understand, I'm talking in generalities about why this policy was introduced. Uh, it affects, obviously, more than just one person. Um, it affects multiple people, but you got to understand that that's why the policy was here to try to, uh, downplay the fact that there are problems and also to, um, just ignore the fact that a lot of this is related to the collapse of the two parent nuclear household. And that's unfortunate. So in any event, I do want to move on to other news. Uh, we have a lot more news out there, including the United States punishing 
Russia over the meddling that has been going on in the cyber attacks. The U.S. has imposed sanctions on 19 Russians, accusing them of interference in the 2016 U.S. election and cyber attacks. They include 13 individuals charged last month by Justice Department Special Counsel uh, Robert Mueller. Mueller it is. I've been saying Mueller. Someone corrected me the other day. I've got a friend who says Mueller, but Bob says Mueller. So Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin accused the Russians of destructive cyber attacks and intrusions targeting critical infrastructure. He said the sanctions would target ongoing nefarious attacks by Russia. They are financial penalties. They're the strongest action taken. Supposedly, the Russians have drawn up countermeasures. There's also an additional story circulating out there that the Russians have been trying to hack the American power grid. You got all of these things going on. Um, And again, keep in mind that the left's narrative is that Donald Trump would do anything and everything to avoid having to deal with the Russians. Here is an example of Donald Trump standing up to the Russians. In fact, the president came out today and said it probably was the Russians who did the attack in Great Britain. You could have, I mean, you could have knocked most reporters in America over with a feather um, with his saying that because none of them thought he would do it. And yet he did. Uh, and he should be commended for that. His his team should be commended for this. Uh, it is very clear the Russians did try to tamper with the elections. And if you are a Trump supporter, there's no reason for you to deny this because the facts are that they tried to tamper with the election. It does not mean that the Russians were trying to get Donald Trump elected. There is no evidence of collusion between Trump and the Russians. What it means is the Russians worked very hard to sow discord uh, in this country, and they were playing both sides. Nobody should run from that. We should all acknowledge the Russians were trying to undermine the election process in the United States, undermine confidence in our democracy, and to a large extent, they have succeeded. Look at how people are at each other's throat these days. Relatedly, by the way, so a bill to replace Georgia's electronic voting machines has passed out a committee. Um, It's Senate Bill 403. And it would replace the electronic voting machines that we have in the state with uh, ones that generate a paper backup to ensure accuracy. Ed Stetzler from Ackworth has been pushing this. Um, It's not a bad piece of legislation. 70% of the nation uses paper ballots. Georgia is one of only five states that relies on entire uh, direct reporting electronic voting machines that have no paper trail. Now, to be clear, uh, there are no allegations, credible allegations, that Georgia's voting system has been hacked. In fact, it'd be pretty hard to hack Georgia's voting system. But it is true that Georgia has electronic machines with no paper backups, and if something were to happen to one of the the card readers, uh, you could lose votes without a paper backup. I am not opposed to a paper backup. Um, There are some people who have criticisms of having these paper backups. Um, Some people would, for example, um, they say it could be complicated, that it could cause confusion. How would they be stored? It could be a nightmare for local governments to store the paper ballots, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just, I'm not opposed to having a paper ballot where someone can actually look at it and say, hmm, the machine recorded it right. And the reason I'm not opposed is because I'm from, Louisiana. And in Louisiana, we had, and Georgia used to have these, you, you would have the, the, the walk-in machines where you pull down the uh, cord and it closes the curtain behind you and you have these little flips and they're based on dials. And Louisiana, particularly during the Huey Long era, was notorious for rigging the dial so the name appeared as candidate X, but the dial twist actually recorded the vote because of the size of the dial or the, the size of the wheel behind it recorded the vote for the other person. And you could have mass vote tampering. And there has always been a suspicion among people in Georgia that something like that could happen here. And there's never been proof of it. I don't think it was happened. I think we have a very good electronic voting service. But having someone have a paper ballot and say, hmm, my vote really was was cast for this person, I think gives people some reassurance and does provide a backup if something happens to the electronic voting machines. 
all that being said, it's only as good as the is only as good as the people who are using the machines and processing the votes. And Fulton County is still going to take a million years to count a vote, regardless of what they do. In fact, a paper ballot maybe that'll make Fulton County worse. Y'all, I am just aggravated with UPS right now. I sent a package to my house uh, this afternoon because it needed to be signed for. I but then I decided, you know what? I can fill out the shipment author the the authorization form, so no one has to worry. They can leave it if no one's home. Well, I did, and then the driver apparently showed up at the house and still wanted someone to sign for it, even though I'd already done the pre-authorization and according to my wife she pulls into the driveway that the ups truck driver is blocking the driveway so she's got to wait for him to move so she can get into the driveway and he doesn't bother to get out of the car or out of the truck again with the package and drives off without it so aggravating um oh my goodness that just it it makes me so mad and you know in particular i mean not to get off on a personal subject but for some reason they've they've altered the route and so our neighborhood is the last neighborhood every day of the week to get deliveries from ups and so this just that's why i did the author signing the the pre-authorization so aggravating uh anyway when we come back we got a lot more news to cover including who next is getting fired in the trump administration perhaps jeff sessions It is nine after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News on WSB. The phone number 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. There is a lot more news out there beyond the high school situation, but there is a story related to the walkouts yesterday. Um, a Rockland high school teacher in Rockland, California is on paid administrative leave over her views about the national school walkout. The teacher said all she did was open the debate about politics of the protests in her classroom. She teaches history. She said it was appropriate to talk with her class about the politics, but said the school disagreed with her views and told her she had to stay home. You know, this is the thing about the school walkout yesterday. Um, I can't believe that schools would be tolerant of people expressing dissent in this, in most public schools. And I think the evidence is on my side. We have now have about a dozen stories from different places around the country where students were compelled to leave the classroom as well and go to the protest, whether they wanted to or not. We have stories of students who were harassed for expressing gun rights views at the protests. And now we have this class where the teacher is put on leave because she decided to engage in a debate with the students and expressed her view. And in expressing her view, it it was not something the school liked. You know, dissent was patriotic until Barack Obama became president. And now no one is allowed to dissent from left-wing orthodoxy at all. Um, There can be no deviation from left-wing orthodoxy in modern American culture, whether it's on gay rights, transgenderism, guns, you name it. There's another story out there I just want to touch on briefly because it's a big story this afternoon, uh, and that is the pedestrian bridge at uh, Florida International University collapsing. I realize it doesn't affect anyone here. Um, I hope um, I hope none of your loved ones have been trapped. There were uh, several people dead, people trapped under the bridge. Um, but the construction firms behind the bridge are facing accusations of unsafe practices. The bridge was installed last week. And the campus there at FIU sent out a press release heralding it as a a new way of speedy construction practices. Uh, it was a model for speedy construction practices. 
And uh, let me read you in particular a paragraph. Uh, This project is an outstanding example of the ABC method. The chair of FIU Civil and Environmental Engineering Department and director of FIU's ABC UTC Adarod Azizinamini. Okay, Um, who is one of the world's leading experts on accelerated bridge construction. Building the major element of the bridge, its main span superstructure, outside of the traveled way and away from busy 8th Street is a milestone. The FIU Sweetwater University City Bridge is the largest pedestrian bridge moved via self-propelled modular transportation in U.S. history. It's also the first in the world to be constructed entirely of self-cleaning concrete. Self-cleaning concrete? When exposed to sunlight, the Titanic Titanium dioxide in the concrete captures pollutants and turns it bright white, reducing maintenance costs. They put a lot of time and effort into this bridge and got it done timely, and it has collapsed. Uh, not exactly the the great uh, celebrated event uh, that they want to claim. Um, tragedy, nonetheless. Um, so... Let me just give you this Washington Post story. President Trump boasted in a fundraising speech Wednesday that he made up information in a meeting with the leader of a top U.S. ally, saying he insisted to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau that the United States runs a trade deficit with its neighbor to the north without knowing whether that is true. Trudeau came to see me. He's a good guy, Justin. I said, no, no, we have we have no trade deficit with you. We have none, Donald. Please, Trump said, mimicking Trudeau. Nice guy, good-looking guy comes in. Donald, we have no trade deficit. He's very proud because everyone else, you know, we're, we're getting killed. So he's proud. I said, wrong, Justin, you do. I didn't even know. I had no idea. I just said, you're wrong. You know why? Because we're, we're so stupid. And I thought they were smart. I said, you're wrong, Justin. He said, nope, we have no trade deficit. I said, well, in that case, I feel differently, but I don't believe it. I sent one of our guys out, his guy, my guy, they went out. I said, check, because I can't believe it. Well, sir, you're actually we're, you're actually right. We have no deficit, but that doesn't include energy and timber. And when you do, we lose $17 billion a year. It's incredible. So here's the big story from the Washington Post. That Donald Trump says he made up the trade claim in a meeting with Justin Trudeau. I talked to a buddy of mine who was in this fundraiser, who was at this fundraiser. And he said no one around him took it as the president saying he lied to Justin Trudeau. No no one understood that. Uh, it, it understood as that was that's what he was saying. What they gathered from the speech, at least what this friend of mine I talked to gathers from the speech, is that the president was saying he didn't really know, but his gut told him there was a trade deficit, and so that's what he told Trudeau. He wasn't making it up, per se. It's that he told Justin Trudeau, I don't know, but I think we have a trade deficit. And Trudeau said, no, we don't. And so Trump said, okay, let's get your guy and my guy to go out and figure out what it is. And sure enough, they came back in and and said there isn't really a trade deficit per se, but when you factor in energy and timber, we have a $17 billion a year trade deficit. And, you know, this is yet another, yet again, another example of the media just getting their panties in a wad over this president of the United States and the things he says in ways that they would never have been upset had Barack Obama said something similar, said, I, I don't, I don't know, but I told him this is what I think. And, and he told me it was wrong. And I said, let's get two of our guys to go out and check it out. I mean, again, this, let me read you what he said. This is the president from the transcript. Um, Trudeau came to see me. He's a good guy, Justin. He said, no, no, we have no trade deficit with you. We have none. Donald, please. I said, wrong, Justin, you do. I didn't even know. I had no idea. I I just said, you're wrong. You know why? Because we're not, because we're so stupid. And I thought they were smart. I said, you're wrong, Justin. He said, no, we have no trade deficit. I said, well, in that case, I feel differently. I said, but I don't believe it. So I sent our guys out, his guy, my guy, they can't went back. Said I said, check because I can't believe it. This is not a story of Donald Trump lying. To Justin Trudeau. This is a story of Donald Trump thinking something, being told he was wrong, and asking for the facts to correct him if it's wrong. 
That's what this story is. But you never know that from the media, the hysteria of the media on this story. And it is a major story today. And you know who's talking about the story? It's not a bunch of Republicans talking about the story. It's reporters talking about the story. Reporters talking about their own reporting as if, oh, we caught Donald. We got it. We got it. We got audio. We got secret audio from a fundraiser. And he admits to lying. I don't read it that way at all. And someone I talked to who was at the fundraiser said no one there took it that way either. Just a brief time out for a sponsor that I love and I use multiple times a day. It is my Quip toothbrush. Now, listen, I realize there are other toothbrushes out there that are electric and do all sorts of fancy things. The Quip toothbrush is an electric toothbrush with a great vibration to clean your teeth And it's very basic, and that's why I love it, because I've tried other electric toothbrushes, and you got to deal with the chargers and all the bells and whistles, and some of them have heads that are so fat, they can't get between your gum and your teeth. And I don't understand why they do that. I had two. I wound up throwing them away. The Quip is so great, and I never have to worry about packing a charger with me. It works on batteries, and listen, I take this thing everywhere I go. I've got braces right now, so I'm having to brush my teeth constantly throughout the day. Uh, The Quip toothbrush is fantastic and the cool thing about quip is that they give you new brush heads every three months well i shouldn't say give but you can get new brush heads every three months and it's just five dollars including free shipping worldwide so you're never going to have to worry about the bristles getting worn out on the, the toothbrush it is great it comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel anywhere Listen, I think the world of this toothbrush, I've had tons of electric toothbrushes from all the names you know, some you don't know, and this is the one I've stuck with. Not because I'm doing an ad and this is a sponsorship, that doesn't matter. I use it because the toothbrush is great, it's convenient, I don't have to worry about a charger, it really, really does a good job, and it vibrates. So every 30 seconds, it times you for a two-minute brush to move to a different part of your mouth, so I'm really getting my teeth clean. My dentist has noticed, my orthodontist with the braces commented the other day on it. So Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash Eric. It's spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. Get Quip today. And thanks to Quip for sponsoring the show. Y'all, I was reminded in my notes, and then a buddy of mine, Fred on Twitter, direct messaged me and asked me if I'd heard about the same story. The kid who had the the sign at the rally, uh, it was a gun right sign at the at the march walkout yesterday. They escorted him off school premises into a police car. Yes, because he supported gun rights. I thought all sides were welcome. No, clearly not. Uh, This was partisan and organized. It was not an organic movement, as some people have claimed. The puppy mill bill, I have not talked about it in a while because it hasn't gone anywhere. It hasn't advanced. But there's a similar bill that just irks me. It's House Bill 876. Uh, Dunwoody and Sandy Springs are taking real issue with this legislation in the state capitol. And it seems very minor. But Dunwoody and Sandy Springs both have legislation that says that buildings that are more than three stories have to be constructed of steel and masonry. They can't be constructed of wood. And while it has driven up costs in those areas, it has also been a safety issue. Um, There were a series of apartment fires and whatnot that caused these and other municipalities in Georgia to do this. Well, (sighs) this legislation, HB 876, would prohibit local governments from requiring... Uh, steel and masonry in their building codes. Why? Because the timber industry wants it. No, you can't make that up. I mean, this is one of the the ridiculous things that happens. The timber industry uh, wants these cities to be forced to use wood frame construction for uh, multi-story apartment complexes and whatnot uh, and office buildings. And Dunwoody and Sandy Springs have said no because it is a fire safety issue in their mind, in their community, because of problems they've had in the past uh, when they changed their code. And so the the timber industry 
and some developers hired lobbyists and now are trying to get this bill passed. It's just, it's so ridiculous. Is it any wonder people are so skeptical of government and the ability to just pay money to, to get things from government? It's just, wow, it makes you cynical. Here's another one. Texting while driving and using your cell phones. I want to talk about it when we come back. I'm going to to touch on a delicate subject. Whether or not we should be able to use our phones in our cars. We have a law in Georgia that prohibits texting while driving. Um, If you are using your phone looking down with it. Some of you have either CarPlay, that's Apple's version, or Android uh, Play, which is uh, the Android Google operating system version where essentially... If you have a car that supports it, um, you can do speech to text to text without ever looking at your phone, things like that. Uh, many, many cars these days have um, speaker systems that your car phones and inter- your phones integrate with through Bluetooth or whatnot. There's a bill before the legislature right now that would mandate hands-free driving. Uh, you would not be allowed to look at your phone in any way, shape, or form. wouldn't be allowed to touch it while driving. And I got to say, while I'm torn on this and I recognize that there is data that suggests in states that have this, they've seen uh, vehicle collisions and fatalities decline. I'm opposed. Uh, Now, full disclosure, I am bad and getting better at looking at my phone while driving. Um, I have started having to put my phone away because I realized I was getting distracted by it. Um, and having to put it in a compartment where it's plugged into USB so CarPlay works. Uh, But sometimes it doesn't work effectively. And there have been at least two occasions in the last three or four months where I truly needed to make a phone call and had to get my phone out and make the phone call. Uh, And it was, you know, when lives were, when life was simpler and we didn't have cell phones, when we actually had good sounding phone conversations, um, you could, you would be on the road all day and not be able to call. We also had pay phones and whatnot, but I'm just, I am philosophically opposed to this. And my reasons for being philosophically opposed to it are for a couple of reasons. One, I don't think there's a big difference between actually being on a phone call. And I'm not talking about reading on the internet. Uh, my God, I passed someone the other day who is literally reading a book driving down the road. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about surfing the web. I'm not talking about um, tapping out messages on your phone. I'm talking about having a phone call. Your phone is to your ear. I don't know that there is any greater distraction between that and trying to eat in your car, and that is not illegal. Can people be distracted? Yes, they can be distracted through a wide range of things. Is it your fault if you cause an injury or a death? Yes, it is, and you will pay the price. So you should be careful. But I also think we live in a day and age where people don't appreciate that you are unplugged. Even on airplanes these days, there is a demand for being able to message uh, because of the world we live in. And it may be a world you wish we did not live in or we as you wish we escaped from. But this is the world we live in, and we're not asking we're, we're not having a piece of legislation that would prohibit phone calls in cars. We are prohibiting, uh, this legislation would prohibit your ear from being next to the phone to listen to the person. That's what this bill does. And I think either ban driving and talking on the phone, period, or don't. Uh, But I think it also opens up a whole host of issues that are rampant for police abuse. And that is an angle that's not getting discussed, and I think it should. There is an issue of police abuse, and I don't mean to disparage good police officers, but under the current situation that we have now where you can't text and drive, you can look at your phone. How does a police officer know you're looking at your phone to make a call or you are not? There's a lot of discretion there. And it is rife for, up. Oh, I think you were texting, I saw you with your phone. Well, there's an additional area here. You say no phones at all. No phones at all. 
you can do, you can call, you can make, you, you can have uh, wireless calls, you can use Bluetooth, but you can't touch your phone. What if you have to touch your phone to hang up the phone? What if, uh, there are lots of what ifs here because they happen on a daily basis and you know it and I know it. Uh, the moment the iPhone came out and we lost buttons on phones, what happens if your screen freezes? You, you, you touch your screen to try to hang up the phone. It doesn't. There's a problem. You got to reset it. You got to pull it out. You got to do it because otherwise your phone's going to be all wonky. It, it's got to happen. Do you, do you get a ticket? Does the police officer understand? Does the police officer have the discretion? There are tons of problems with this. Um, hands-free driving. It, you know, we had a case up in, what was it, uh, Forsyth County. Two years ago, was it? Where a police officer pulled somebody over for eating while driving. There, there's no allegation that the guy was actually weaving across the road. The police officer just decided it was distracted driving because he was eating. I just, I, I, I think police have better things to do then see, up. Oh, this person has a phone next to their ear. They're, they're, they're looking forward. They're driving. They're having a conversation. I was, for the longest time, opposed to the texting while driving legislation. A friend of mine sponsored it. Um, having a wife now on a motorcycle, I totally get that. Um, seeing the number of people who are trying to text and drive, uh, banging, it out, banging it out on their phone with their thumbs, and then suddenly uh, they're weaving. I just yesterday, coming back from Atlanta... Had a guy on the connector in my moving into my lane. I had to move into the HOV lane to avoid a collision with the guy and looked over and he was writing. He was actually writing with a pen on a clipboard while driving. I get the distracted driving stuff. I do. And it concerns me. It concerns me with my kids. Um, but I just think at some point you got to say, you know, people have to be responsible. We can't legislate responsibility. People need to be responsible. And we're piling burdens on police officers to check for it. We're giving it one more thing. Police can pull you over for. They can give you a ticket for. I just, you know, at some point, people are either going to be responsible or not. They're either going to try to get out of the habit and they're going to have a car that has a wireless system where they can make a phone call or they're not. And I just think philosophically, we're compounding burdens on police. We're compounding burdens on people. And we are in a 21st century. Maybe we do need to invest in the driverless car, the driverless car, so people can chat on their phones all day. But I do know, in the present circumstances, there are many people who cannot escape a phone call. I am one of them, and it's ridiculous if the phone is to my ear and I am driving. I'm not texting on my phone. I'm not reading the internet. I'm having a conversation as I would with the person next to me in the car. If they were in the car, if they just happen to be on my phone, somehow that's bad. Maybe we should ban all conversations in cars because I know plenty of people who get in animated conversations with the person in the passenger seat and they're more distracted than me with a phone next to my ear having a conversation with someone. I just think it's more of the nanny statism and I don't think it's right. You know, another thing about this hands-free calling legislation is what about people who use their phones for navigation, for GPS, could impact that with the law. So I just, I'm not a fan. I'm not. It looks like the bill's not going anywhere in the Senate, though. Also, not going to be here tomorrow. I start filming new TV series. Yes, The Resurgent Family, we're calling it, starts filming tomorrow in Washington. If you're interested in getting more about it, learning more about it, text the word FAMILY to 345-345. I'm going to be interviewing Nancy Piercy, who has a new book out, uh, Love Thy Body, about uh, transgenderism and, well, the illogic of, of secularism in the country. So text FAMILY to 345-345 if you want more info, and I'll talk to you guys on Monday. <laughs>